We're going to go ahead and get started with the next part of our program. I love all that enthusiasm out there, you guys. Fantastic. Good morning and welcome to the Community Breakout on Summit Race and Inclusion. Once again, I'm Keith Kanarska, the superintendent for the Grand Haven Area Public Schools, and it is an honor for me to be able to introduce our speaker today. Sean Harper is a tenured faculty member in the Graduate School of Education, Africana Studies, and Gender Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also serves as the executive director of the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education. Dr. Harper is the author of over 90 peer-reviewed journal articles and other academic publications. His work explores race and gender and educational access and achievement and the effects of educational policies and on campus environments and on student engagement and outcomes. He also has published 11 books, including Advancing Black Male Student Success from Preschool through PhD. It is truly an honor to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Harper. Thank you. Good morning. It is fantastic to see you all and to be back in Michigan where it is still winter. <laughs> we were driving in last night and I, and I asked, it, it, are those really snow flurries I see? And they actually were. Uh, nonetheless, um, I'm really uh, delighted to uh, be here. I appreciate, uh, Keith, your uh, great introduction. I hassled Keith about keeping the introduction brief, and he did, he did so appropriately. So thank you very, very much. I wanted to manage your expectations of me. Uh, so I've spent quite a bit of time in Michigan. I've done uh, research at University of Michigan and at Michigan State. And I uh, had an opportunity to spend some time at Olivet College, uh, which was just really terrific. So I'm delighted to be here in your community and to talk with you about my work. I decided to frame our time together here this morning a bit differently. Um, oftentimes, when we get together as educators um, to talk about diversity and to talk about race, it's almost always about students of color, families of color, teachers of color, people of color, right? Um, obviously, as a person of color, I think that is, you know, really, really, really important. But I also recognize that your community is 95% white and your uh, school district here is roughly 90% white. So I thought this would be a really important occasion to talk about sort of the implications of diversity and of race on white students, on white people. Uh, many of these ideas that I am about to share with you um, are informed by my latest book, Race Matters in College. Now, I understand that this particular audience is largely comprised of K-12 educators. So therefore, I've adapted some of the ideas and arguments from the book on college students and college context for this particular audience. I think that, um, you know, again, many of those ideas, uh, you know, certainly span both K-12 and higher education context. As Keith mentioned, I founded uh, four years ago and currently serve as executive director of the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education at the University of Pennsylvania. That center is both K-12 and higher ed. So, um, you know, I do a lot of thinking, in fact, about race and, um, and, and, uh, and, and racism and uh, racist practices and policies and so on uh, in, in K-12 context. Uh, I invite you throughout our time together here uh, over the next hour or so to be uh, Twitter engaged. So if I see you on your smartphones, I won't mistake it for a sign of disrespect or disengagement. In fact, I will presume that you are inviting others uh, across the nation and across the world into the conversation that we're having here and that you're being reflective um, it's always a real treat for me when I get back on the plane after one of these things to sort of go back and read the hashtag from bottom up to see what people were thinking at various junctures, twists, and turns uh, throughout our time here. So uh, I'm going to get into uh, the substance here of the, of the talk, uh, what we teach white kids about race. Um, to do that, I'm going to show a very quick, uh, quick video clip. 
Anderson Cooper, AC360, CNN Weeknights, 10 Eastern. There are lots of different colors for skin. I have questions for you about these pictures of different children. After I read the question, I want you to point to the picture that fits the story. Are children colorblind in America? Show me the smart child. Show me the mean child. Can you show me the dumb child? Show me the nice child. <laughs> is bias measurable even at an early age? Why is she the bad child? Because she's black, black. And why is he the ugly child? Because he, he looks like he white. Why is he the dumb child? Because she has dark brown skin. Why is she the bad child? Because she makes fun of everybody else's skin color. How much do kids learn from what they see and hear from adults? Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. These are questions that we, along with CNN's Soledad O'Brien and a team of psychologists hired by CNN, spent months investigating through tests, interviews with children and their parents. But they're questions that have been asked for decades. The first doll study ignited controversy in the 1940s, when psychologist Kenneth and Mamie Clark pioneered studies in the effects of segregation in schools by asking African-American kids to choose between black and white dolls. The so-called doll test found black kids overwhelmingly preferred white over black. Those results were at the center of the landmark 1954 Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education, that desegregated American schools. Now, with the first African-American president and nearly 60 years after segregation was overturned, we wondered, where are we today? How do kids see differences in race? What we discovered might shock you, but first, how we got there. Skin color, child skin color estimate. Okay, yeah. We asked renowned child psychologist and University of Chicago researcher Dr. Margaret Beale Spencer to design a pilot study for CNN and analyze the results. Our children are always near us, you know, uh, because we're a society, and what we put out there, kids report back. <laughs> you ask the question, they'll give you the answer. Spencer's team tested more than 130 kids in eight schools with very different racial and economic demographics. Half of the schools were in the north, half in the south. Oh, nicely done. While the country is much more diverse today than in the 1940s, the children in this project are from two age groups and two races, white and black to better allow comparison to the original doll study. Four and five-year-old children were asked a series of questions about these images. Nine and ten-year-old children were asked questions about the same images as well as this color bar chart. The tests led us to three major findings. First, white children as a whole responded with a high rate of what researchers call white bias, identifying the color of their own skin with positive attributes and darker skin with negative attributes. Show me the dumb child. Dumb child. <laughs> okay, why is she the dumb child? Because she has black skin. Show me the mean child. Why is he the mean child? Because he's brown. Show me the bad child. Why is he the bad child? Because he is black. Okay. Show me the ugly child. Why is he the ugly child? Because he's Black. Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. Show me the child who has the skin color most children like. Show me the child who has the skin color most children don't like. Show me the child who has the skin color most girls want. Show me the child who has the skin color most girls don't want. The questions that got overwhelmingly white biased answers? Show me the dumb child. About 76% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the mean child. About 66% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the child who has the skin color most children don't like. Again, about 66% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the bad child. 
More than 59 percent of the older white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. So the findings of this particular pilot study, I think, have serious implications and consequences for our nation, certainly in a place that has a large share of white children, right? Um, I would imagine that some of you are deeply disturbed by what you just saw, right? Uh, There is uh, a body of research in psychology. In fact, there was a Newsweek uh, cover story about three years ago that talked about this research, and it had a cover image of a white baby with the headline on the front cover, Is Your Baby Racist? And in that particular Newsweek uh, feature, they talked about this body of psychological studies that showed that children as young as six months old can actually determine racial differences, either in hair texture, pigmentation and skin tone, and in other sort of features and markers. Now, obviously, a six-month-old does not have the cognitive resources to make sense of why we might be shaded differently or, you know, why our features might be differently. But we socialize children to make certain meanings of race and the racial other in the ways that you just saw uh, played themselves out in in that that CNN um, experiment. But I want to talk a bit more about what we go on to teach children about race beyond the four- and five-year-olds that you just saw on the video, but sort of a longer course of study, if you will, that happens in American schools uh, from coast to coast, including here in the Midwest. Uh, so I want to talk about some of those lessons, and I think I have seven of them uh, that, I, that I've chosen to share. The first is that we teach white children that we are all the same despite our racial differences. So that Newsweek article written about the psychological studies went on to talk about well-intentioned parents who engage in what they believe to be anti-racist parenting, by saying, no, 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 you know, just because Jamal looks different or Hakeem looks different, we're all the same. Well, that sounds like a really good message to share with, you know, a four, five, six, seven-year-old. Those same kinds of messages get conveyed in classrooms by teachers who want to minimize differences between children by saying to them, we're all the same. The problem with that lesson, though, is that we're not all treated the same. We are not all afforded the same opportunities. We don't all have equal access to equal education, fair protection under the law, and so on. So, therefore, we sort of school white children especially to believe that we're all the same, so therefore, you know, things that might happen to people of color and communities and families of color, well, it must be their fault, right? Because the world is just. Merit and meritocracy are real, right? We're all the same. Uh, so that is, I would, I would argue, is uh, one of the very first lessons that we give white children about race. Another is that racially segregated schools and communities are normal. Princeton sociologist Douglas Massey, UCLA education professor Gary Orfield, and scores of demographers across the country confirm for us that U.S. schools are just as segregated now as they were before the passage of Brown v. Board of Education. Even in communities that are perhaps larger than yours, that seem to sort of overall have more racial diversity than you have here. Let's take Chicago, for example. Hyper-segregated. Certainly much more diverse than is Grand Haven, but it's sort of diversity for... For what, right? It's sort of a question I ask, right? What does it matter if you have diversity if schools are still 90% white, 
90% black and Latino, and so on. We in my center did uh, work in 40 public high schools across New York City two years ago. Those schools were 94% black and Latino, right? So again, schools and the neighborhoods in which schools are situated are incredibly segregated by race. So if we don't talk with children about how that's problematic, about the undercurrents and explanatory factors for residential segregation, and what I call in my work also educational segregation, if we don't talk with them about that and make deliberate attempts to get our children into more integrated spaces and communities, we unintentionally convey to them that this is normal, that Latinos only wanna be around Latinos, blacks only wanna be around blacks, Asian Americans only wanna be with their people. This sort of, you know, for me, raises uh, the uh, famous question that Beverly Daniel Tatum asked in her book, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? If you haven't read that book, I would highly recommend it. It is an important text about conversations on race in schools and so on. But the, the question about why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria doesn't raise the corresponding question of, well, if all the black kids are sitting together, all the white kids must be sitting together. Why is the question never about why are all the white kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Why does the burden of integration and the, on and the onus of integrating, why is it always on the students of color? Why is there not a corresponding onus and expectation for white students to integrate with students of color? Again, when we don't disrupt those patterns and sort of these one-sided sort of uh, conceptions of integration and so on, we teach white kids that segregation is normal. The, white, the black kids are sitting together because they want to. Not necessarily. We also teach white children that only a few bad people are racist. You're not racist. I'm not racist. The overwhelming majority of us are not racist. It's only a few bad people who do racist, outrageously racist things who are racist. Institutions, structures, laws, the Constitution, policies, and so on, those aren't racist. We convey to children. But there are numerous compelling sources of evidence that show us over and over and over again, Rachel, Rachel Gossel uh, shared many of them in her keynote, um, that race continues to be real in all factions and in all sectors of our society, our economy, our democracy. The Constitution was never colorblind, right? The Constitution literally, literally denied certain citizenship rights to people of color. But we don't teach that in school. We teach that the Constitution was this amazing thing, right? And, you know, I am a proud American. I'm not proud of the racism that is, uh, that has historically and contemporarily been woven into our America. But nonetheless, I'm a proud American, so I don't necessarily hate the Constitution. But there are some racially accurate things about the Constitution that we don't teach, right? So again, we, you know, sort of say to kids that, yes, it was this one bad person who shot and murdered Trayvon Martin, right? But that's not, that was sort of an offshoot. It was sort of a random example. These things happen all the time across our country in one way or another. We teach white kids that Whites belong on top in positions of leadership, authority, influence, wealth, and that people of color belong largely in service and custodial roles. When we look at the stratification of the American workforce, including schools, we see overwhelmingly that 
white people occupy positions of authority. All but one American president has been white. The majority of governors, white, mayors, senators, House of Representatives, uh, other state legislators, CEOs of companies, disproportionately white and male. Housekeepers, groundskeepers, food service workers, and so on, disproportionately people of color. So when we don't disrupt these patterns in the labor sector, including employment patterns in schools, we silently, but very powerfully, convey to all children, including children of color and white children, that whites belong on top, that the power belongs with you. Not so much with people of color. We teach white children that hashtag Black Lives Matter, the hashtag that became popular after the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson. You know, there was a lot of conversation about the wealth and the, uh, and the mattering of black lives. Also after the death of Eric Gardner and the, the verdicts that, that came back in those cases, right? Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Well, well yeah, for like those three months, right? During which um, there was a lot of national conversation and media coverage. Yes, during that time. Perhaps, maybe, maybe in February during Black History Month. But black lives don't matter in the curriculum. Which is why we don't really read about black lives in texts that are assigned to students, right? In fact, at best, Martin Luther King and Barack Obama are the only people of color worth learning about. Is a lesson that we teach white children when we exclude other persons of color in their contributions in the making of America, in text, in classroom examples, in films that we show, and so on, right? We don't expose white children to a range of cultural perspectives beyond their own. Martin Luther King and Barack Obama, that's it, right? Maybe Rosa Parks. Maybe, in some school settings. So again, this really sort of conveys to young children that their group is superior, their group matters most, which is why you saw those children sort of picking along the color bar chart who's the child that most adults like. The white children were overwhelmingly picked almost entirely picking the white child. Yes, because it's the white child and white families and white cultural histories that get conveyed and taught in curriculum. Lastly, we teach white kids that boys of color are all bad behaving, but they're athletically gifted. Rachel shares some of the school suspension statistics. The data from the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights very clearly show that there are enormous racial differences in school expulsions and suspensions across the country. With black boys being suspended at exponentially higher rates. So if you're a white kid in a predominantly white class and your white teacher, by the way, whites comprise 84% of the teaching force in the United States, and the overwhelming majority of those are white women, right? So you're this kid, white kid, you have your white female teacher, and she's kicking out the black boys, like, all the time for, as Rachel showed in her data, for being disrespectful or whatever the term is, right? Well, then... 
you begin to sort of internalize these criminalized notions of who young men of color are. They're bad. They're deviant. They should be kicked out. They should be locked up, right? There's sort of a lesson. There's a, there is an unintentional sort of curriculum for this by which white kids are schooled. So I do now want to turn to sort of the longer term consequences and why you should really care about this in a community that is 95% white with schools that are 90% white and with white children, right? So here's why you should care about this. And I'm going to sort of let Anderson Cooper uh, sort of walk us into um, sort of the longer term consequences. Time now for the ridiculous. So Monday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day and at events around the country, obviously Americans paid tribute to the civil rights leader's life and his legacy and with respect and solemnity celebrated his vision, honored his dream. There were memorials, parades, days of service. Many volunteers spent the day making a difference in others' lives. And then there's what happened at Arizona State University where members of the Tau Kappa Epsilon fraternity threw what they called the MLK Black Party. What might that entail, you ask? Just your average white kids dressed in basketball jerseys, throwing gang signs, and drinking from, believe it or not, watermelon cups. Now, I know, you don't want to believe that something so racist and asinine and ignorant could actually happen in 2014. Frankly, it would be easier just to pretend that someone got the story wrong. And after all, there's no proof that this happened, right? Well, there is. In fact, they posted pictures of the party on Instagram with hashtags like, Happy MLK Day, homies and blackout for MLK. There's the woman with a watermelon cup. Arizona State says the university will not tolerate this kind of behavior. It suspended the Tau Kappa Epsilon fraternity while it investigates, and the school is also planning action against the individuals involved. You know, the last time we had a story about frat bros on the ridiculous, it was about those guys who allegedly consumed boxes of wine through their posteriors with a system of rubber tubing. I think it was called Tour de Franzia. Anyway, I have to say, those guys, they're freaking Rhodes Scholars compared to these MLK Day frat bros. And that's the thing. We're just plumbing the depths of stupidity here. To me, it is terrifying, terrifying that these people made it into college without learning anything about what is appropriate human behavior and terrifying that they've got such an astounding lack of awareness and are so moronic about themselves and the world to actually post pictures of it like it's the spring semi-formal or whatever. Plus, it's, the dumb, it's just the dumbest idea I think I've ever heard of. Whatever happened to the good old-fashioned toga party? There's still that, that, that's still a frat bro thing, isn't it? Actually, you know what, scratch that. I would not want to see what this particular group of morons would do if you gave them a bunch of white sheets. Look, I get some college kids are going to do stupid things. I get this generation of college kids seems determined to document it all online, where to live forever, a permanent testament to shameless idiocy. Perhaps that fact is punishment enough, though on the ridiculous. So here's why you should care about this. Wouldn't you be horrified and quite embarrassed, in fact, if that was a student who graduated from this high school who made national news for doing something so racist? Wouldn't that embarrass you? It would make your superintendent look really bad that this kid who graduated from a school for which he provides leadership is on a bus with his fraternity brothers at the University of Oklahoma singing a song about niggers being lynched and not being, uh, uh, never, they'll never be in our fraternity. Wouldn't that be terrible? If you were a parent of a white child, trust me, so I don't have any white children, but if I did, I wouldn't want them on national news looking stupid and racist. None of us wants that for our kids, for the students we teach, and for people who are part of our community. Never been white, but I'm pretty sure that you don't want that, right? But that's what happens when we don't disrupt some of the lessons that we teach white children about race that I shared, you know, a couple slides ago, right? So Anderson Cooper said that he was horrified, right, that, you know, kids could go to college, 
you know, not having been sort of properly taught about what is appropriate or that kids could get into college and not understand, um, you know, sort of how things could be perceived and understood. It's racist. I actually can understand it and believe it because I think it is a byproduct of the educational negligence with which we teach about and engage in race. Um, we teach white children, and so I want to get into some of the consequences here, right? So those lessons that I shared with you about what we teach, um, you know, the consequences are that, are that uh, we, we say to them that racial mockery and racial microaggressions are common, that it's okay, right? So this incident from Arizona State, the more recent incident from University of Oklahoma, those were not isolated incidents. Those were only the ones that got caught, right? There are these racial theme parties, blackface parties, south of the border parties that, uh, that mock Mexican-Americans, and, you know, these other, like, ridiculously racist fraternity parties that happen on college campuses year after year across the country, right? I would argue that we teach kids that it's okay to do these things because otherwise, why would they do them? Where'd they get this from? Right? I want to give a quick example, and I want to situate it in a uh, collegiate context. Um, I understand that, you know, this is a largely uh, K-12 crowd, but I think that this example is helpful about how we teach white kids that racial uh, mockery and, and, and microaggressions. By the way, I don't want to take for granted uh, that everyone understands, you know, particular terms. So racial microaggressions, unlike overt sort of, you know, use of racial epithets and, you know, like calling someone the N-word or, you know, like deliberately like doing something that, that's racist. Racial microaggressions are a lot more subtle. They're also a lot more everyday. They're everyday occurrences that occur for people of color um, that suggest to us that either we don't belong or we're not viewed as smart, or whatever. Um, so I want to give you an example. And it's from Michigan Tech, another campus I visited here in your great state. A few years ago, I was giving a talk at Michigan Tech, and I got there the evening before. So the organizers of my visit thought that because a portion of my research is on uh, young men of color, that it made sense to organize a dinner with me and you know about 25 or so uh, black undergraduate men up at, up at the university. So I'm at this dinner with these guys, and you know I start with a question of, so this is my first time in the UP. Um, give me a sense, what is it like to be a black dude here at Michigan Tech? Two hours later, guys were still responding to that very first question, right? They had a lot to say about the realities of their racialized experience in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan on this particular campus. But there was this one guy who told a story about being the only non-white person in one of his science and engineering classes. And it was a large lecture style course that was taught in an auditorium that I imagined to be, you know, similar to this, right? So the guy, let's call him Damien. Damien was telling me how in this particular course, the professor made a deal with students about a series of interconnected exams. So the deal was that in this sequence of exams, if ever you got 100 on one exam in the sequence, you were exempt from the remaining exams. I'd never make this kind of deal with my students. <laughs> deal is, you get 100, you're free to go. You don't have to take the rest of the exams. So the students took the first exam in the sequence. They got their grades electronically from the professor the night before class. So in the next day, in the next class session, 
the professor stood at the podium and announced, seven of you got 100 on this first exam in the sequence. You are free to pack your belongings and leave. So one by one, and just imagine, in a room such as the one in which we presently are, but let's just imagine, though, that the exit is here. These two side exits aren't there. So Damien was describing to me that you essentially had to walk past the professor's podium to get out the door of the classroom. Seven students got 100. The first six made their way down the stairs of the lecture hall and out the door uninterrupted. They were white. The seventh student, Damien, made his way down. And before he could get out the door, the professor stopped him and said, wait, you got 100? With the tone of surprise, disbelief, there's no way in the world that the one non-white person in the class could have gotten 100. To be sure, I asked Damien, might you have done something throughout the semester to compel the professor to be so surprised that you got 100? He said to me, quite confidently, Professor Harper, there are 200 people in this class. There's no way that the professor even knew my name or anybody else's name. There were too many of us. Furthermore, I never sleep in class. I'm always on time. I take excellent notes. I'm very engaged. How else do you think I got 100 on the exam? <laughs> so Damien's thing was, you know, other than show up here, you know, twice a week in this black body, I did nothing to compel the professor to be surprised. Now I'm gonna come back to that professor a bit later. But I wanna talk about the educational lesson there. There was in fact a lesson for Damien that his professor thought of him as intellectually not gifted, not being capable of getting a perfect score on the exam and so on. There was that lesson that you don't belong here, right? Damien for sure was microaggressed. That was his lesson. But I would argue that there was an even more powerful lesson for all of the white students who were in the class who saw this happen. That blacks aren't smart. We should be surprised when they are and that this guy must be some sort of exception. That was the lesson that was taught to them. The other lesson was that it's okay to treat a person of color this way and to do so publicly. Every white student in that class was taught that lesson that day from that podium at which the professor stood. Were Damien to sort of turn back around and engage the professor and challenge the professor about, well, why, do you, why did you seem so surprised that I got 100 and not the six white people who just left? The students probably would have thought, oh, why is this guy making this a race issue? Why is he being so sensitive? People of color are so sensitive. They're always racializing everything. This clearly wasn't about race. It was clearly about race. That was the lesson that was taught. So that is a longer term consequence, right? That, you know, when people grow up to become business leaders, elected officials, and so on, and they believe that their employees of color are just tripping and just making everything a race issue, well, they learned that in school. They learned it in their, in their K-12 schooling experiences, and they certainly learned it in college. They also learned that students 
segregate racially or sort of one uh, consequence of these lessons, right, are that students go off to college and so on and they segregate racially, they cluster within racial groups, students learn little about people who are different from themselves, misconceptions go unaddressed, right? These are the longer term consequences. So I wanna take this back to uh, those sociology and demographic studies that show that um, schools and communities are just as segregated now as they were in 1953, 54. Wouldn't it be a shame for a student to graduate from a high school that is 90% white and then go on to a university that is considerably more diverse, but yet still learn nothing about people who are different for, from her or himself, and to come back to this community with the same sorts of unchecked biases and assumptions and so on about who people of color are, that is such a shame. I'm not talking hypothetically here. The center I direct at University of Pennsylvania does uh, racial climate studies, so universities will hire us to come on campus for three to four days to assess the health and the realities of the campus racial climate. And we uh, do a series of interviews and focus groups with students of color and white students while we're there. Uh, one example that sort of reminds me of a community like yours is from University of Texas where we interview this guy who was a junior at the time. And this guy, he's a white, white student, a white undergraduate. He was so frustrated because he grew up in a context that was much like Grand Haven. The guy grew up on a ranch in West Texas where there was not a lot of racial diversity. In fact, his place was even less diverse than yours in that literally his only interactions with people of color before he got to college was by way of television. He had never had a conversation with a person who wasn't white. So this guy talked about how he got this brochure in the mail from University of Texas that showcased so much diversity and talked about how much the university valued diversity and how if you come here, there are students from all 50 states in the District of Columbia. There are students from dozens of countries around the world. This is a place where you will encounter diversity. So this guy thought, like I imagined that a student from Grand Haven, from this high school, who might get that same brochure, might think, well, this will be a real opportunity for me to learn from people who are different. I didn't get that opportunity in my hometown. When we interviewed this guy, he was so frustrated because the patterns of ethnic clustering and segregation were so real, they were so common at UT Austin. Right? They were no different, in fact, from, you know, the entirely white context from which he had come. Furthermore, the guy felt like he was on his own to sort of seek out the diversity. There was no real educational plan for it at the university. And he said to us, as honestly as, as he could possibly be, that he was probably just as racist then as he was when he entered the institution three years prior. That is a long-term consequence of not engaging responsibly as educators in conversations and learning opportunities about race. Rachel talked a bit about stereotype threat. I have been thinking a whole lot about stereotype threat in my work. So most of the studies 
on stereotype threat in the psychology literature have in fact been about people of color and about women in the sciences and women in, you know, predominantly male uh, context. But I, like Phil Goff, the, um, the UCLA professor that Rachel referenced in her talk, I've been thinking about stereotype threat for whites. There are lots of prevailing stereotypes about people of color. But the one very durable stereotype about whites is that you're racist. No one wants to confirm that stereotype. No one wants to embody it. No one wants to be accused of it. Therefore, it's quite paralyzing, in fact, to sort of embark on engaging in a conversation about race because then you might make a racial mistake and come across as racist. There's this anxiety, in fact, about confirming the stereotype about your group. So I'm just going to stay away from these racial conversations and stuff because I just don't want people to think I'm racist. Well, when that happens... Our nation doesn't deal with its racial problems and its racial realities. That's a long-term consequence of not getting ahead of this earlier in, in an educationally more honest and more responsible way. Similarly, students never learn how to resolve racial conflicts or arrive at sophisticated levels of racial understandings if whenever there's something racial that comes up, we run as far away from it as possible in the opposite direction. So, you know, I'm married very happily. Someone wisely told me before I got married that the key to a healthy marriage, trust, and communication. Those, in fact, are two things that keep my marriage, like, you know, very healthy and very vibrant. If we don't know how to talk to each other, we can't trust each other. If our cultural communication skills and competencies are not developed as young Americans in either racially homogenous contexts such as yours, or even in racially diverse contexts such as the one in which I live in Philadelphia, then we don't know how to resolve problems when they arise. The last consequence that I want to talk about here is what I call the miseducation of accidental racist. Racially incompetent teachers, mayors, governors, judges, congresspeople, Supreme Court justices, teachers, other industry leaders, and future parents. No one wants to be racist. I, I don't think. Oh, okay, maybe a few people do, but very few people, I think, sort of, you know, come out the womb thinking, I want to be a racist when I grow up. But again, when we don't engage in teaching and learning about race, we produce accidental racist. I do want to give you one example of an accidental racist. A couple years ago, I was giving a talk at a very prestigious small liberal arts college. It's a college that US News and World Report consistently ranks among the top 10, so I've narrowed the field for you. Uh, you could maybe try to figure out, right? But this is a place that really prides itself on being one of the best educational places on the planet. And it's small enough Right, so the, the beauty of liberal arts colleges is that, you know, they tend to be around 2,000 students, so they tend to be, you know, a lot more intimate, right? Um, you know, think of a place the size of Olivet 
college. I mentioned that I've been there. You know, at a place that size, people can really get to know each other and, you know, sort of these sort of barriers to communication, you know, aren't as um, difficult to overcome as they would be at a place, say, like Indiana University, where I went to uh, school uh, that has 37,000 students, right? So small liberal arts college, um, it is about 90% white, um, um, at least my talk was. The audience where my talk, I would estimate, was about 90% white. So I'm talking to a group of students, an audience of students, about my research on race and campus racial climates. At the end of my talk, we engaged in a Q&A, and there was a young man who raised his hand. He had a question. And as he was framing his question, he said to me, Professor Harper, can you tell me why coloreds do this? And I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, why colored people do that. And I, I just want to, I'm really just trying to sort of understand, like, why you coloreds, so on and so forth. So in the framing of his question, he used the word colored three times. So I, in responding, uh, before responding to his actual question, I did say to him, as lovingly and as supportively as possible. Before I answer your question, you do know that calling people of color colored is improper, right? And I could see his head from the podium. He was shaking his head. It wasn't an act of resistance. In fact, he confirmed what the head shaking was about. He said, actually, I, I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't know that. Why? So I gave him a very, and, and others, a very quick sort of uh, lesson, right, about the historical baggage and significance of the word colored and, you know, how it is offensive to uh, people of color and especially blacks and so on. Uh, so we got it. So, you know, we moved on. At the end of the talk, several people came up to the podium and told me how awesome I was. I invite you to do that at the end of this thing, if you would like. Uh, but several of, of them came up to the, uh, to the podium and they were, you know, you're great. But they were also like, we're so sorry that that guy was so ignorant, right? These are his peers. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. Like, it's totally all right. Well, the guy himself eventually came up to the podium and he said, you know, Dr. Harper, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. And I was like, oh, no, you didn't offend me. It's totally fine. And, you know, to sort of, you know, ease the tension and sort of put him at, at, at ease, you know, I engaged him in a conversation. You know, what's your name? His name is Chris. Chris, good to meet you. Um, and, you know, he said, I'm from a small town. And I said, me too. I grew up in a small town, 18,000 people. Where'd you grow up? And he told me where he grew up. And then he went on to explain that in his small town, there was not racial diversity. That almost everyone there was white. And that they used colored. And people in his family referred to my people as colored people. So therefore, like he just grew up thinking that it was okay to call us colored. And I was like, Chris, and he was just like, so sorry. I'm like, dude, like, it's totally fine, right? Here's how this ends. My talk at this very prestigious liberal arts college was in March. Chris was graduating in May. Two months later, Chris was literally about to go off into the world thinking that it was okay to call people of color colored. Just imagine, just imagine what other deeply held biases, misconceptions, points of view, and so on, that not only Chris as an individual, 
but so many other white students at this college were about to go off into the world with. Just imagine. These people will grow up to become really influential. I teach at an Ivy League university. Every Supreme Court justice, with the exception of Clarence Thomas, the black one, <laughs> he went to the College of Holy Cross. All of the others went to Ivy League universities as undergraduates in Stanford, which is as close to an Ivy as one can get. They all went to law school, including Clarence Thomas, at Ivy League universities and Stanford. If these conversations are never had in homes with young children, in K-12 schooling context, in undergraduate institutions, which was the case for Chris at this liberal arts college, Let's imagine that Chris then goes on to law school where there are not honest and serious conversations about race. Then Chris goes on to a legal career where he never confronts his deeply seated biases and misconceptions and his own miseducation around people of color. Then he becomes a Supreme Court justice someday. He will make laws and enact policies that perpetually disadvantage people in communities of color and I would argue damage all of America. It's not just about making accommodations for people of color. As the nation becomes more diverse and more brown, if we don't do better by people of color, it will hurt all of us. It will hurt our entire economy. Right? And I would argue that it will continue to hurt white children who don't understand and who don't have the, uh, the, the cultural competence and, and, and tools and so on to interact with the racially diverse America that is much more diverse than is this place. So I want to wrap up here by sharing with you some ideas um, for addressing the issues and the consequences about which I've spoken. The first is that we have to engage, and I mean in a really honest and authentic way, in both individual and collective self-reflection on our own socialization and biases. What I mean by this is that moving ahead on these issues requires each of us in this auditorium to honestly think about and grapple with what you saw in that CNN video with those children. Juxtapose what you saw in that video with your own upbringing what you were told about people who were different from you, how your sense-making of the world may have in fact been contaminated by media messages that consistently criminalize certain groups or place in poverty and create these sort of impoverished views of other groups, right? It demands as individual educators that we ask ourselves questions like, am I really disproportionately only referring the few black boys to the principal's office? Why am I doing that? Or, I'm a certified teacher who went to a school of education. What did I really learn about race at my school of education? 
What did I really learn? How prepared do I really feel? Like if no one else is watching and I'm like in a conversation with myself, um, do I really know what I'm doing? Am I really scared to actually sort of open up the proverbial can of worms, the proverbial Pandora's box and engage in conversations? It demands that level of individual honesty. It also demands an honest conversation among colleagues in a school where we not only look at achievement data by race and make sense of that, but we also ask ourselves questions like, are we really preparing white children here in Grand Haven to be appreciators of diversity, to not become accidental racist? And if our answer is yes, we, 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 are, we, we are preparing kids in that way, it might be good to sort of make clear, like, okay, now how are we doing that? Where does that occur? Who does it? How do we know for sure that we're doing it in ways that are most effective? I want to go back very quickly and talk about the achievement data because oftentimes, right, like we look at data and we might see some racial inequities in those data. These kinds of collective uh, reflections demand that we move beyond sort of um, the common explanations that, well, the black kids are not doing so great here and the Latino kids are not doing so great here because they have parents and families who just don't care, right? Or because the kids themselves don't care and the kids are disengaged. Instead, this kind of reflection demands that we ask questions of ourselves like, well, what am I doing to engage the one or two black kids in my class? What am I doing to infuse their culture and the cultures of America into my class, even if my students are 90% white, right? What am I doing that might make students of color feel like they don't belong? So that level, again, of individual and collective reflection is, is important. So is professional literacy and purposeful engagement in uh, development activities um, that bolster racial competence. What do I mean by professional literacy? So higher education is my predominant field of study, although the center I direct is both the K-12 and, and higher ed center. Um, and I do, in fact, teach um, some aspiring teachers, K-12 teachers, uh, in the Graduate School of Education at Penn. Um, so, but I, I want to say about the professional literacy that when I'm talking to groups of college administrators, usually in audiences that are this big, like 200 of them, they unashamedly confess to me that they can't read. So when we're talking about sort of the scholarship on diversity and on teaching diverse populations and raising questions in productive ways about race and, you know, infusing current events into the classroom to sort of awaken racial understanding and so on, you know, all of this stuff, there's a tremendous body of literature on these things. It's vast. It's very good. I've written some of it myself. <laughs> but people, my colleagues... These are administrators say to me, we, we can't, we can't read. What, 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 what do you mean you can't read? Like almost all of you have master's degrees and a large share of you have doctorates. What do you mean you can't read? And they say, we can't read because we don't have time. I would imagine that I might get some similar confessions of illiteracy among K-12 educators who might say, you know, I really don't have time outside of school to read this stuff because I have to grade papers. You know, I have my own family and children and others to care for. And, you know, I also want to have a life, right? My pushback to those teachers will be the same pushback I give to my higher ed administrator friends. When I say to them, 
that Anita Lee has been my primary care physician for the past eight years since I moved to Philadelphia. I would be absolutely mortified if during one of my visits to her, she said to me that she hadn't read a thing since medical school because she doesn't have time. Now, she's clearly very, very busy because every time I see her, she's seeing me and like four other patients simultaneously. My point here is that if she has time to read, we have time to read, right? So many answers to so many of the dilemmas and problems and highly consequential things that I've talked about in this talk have been written about. Great guidance has been given in the literature. We have to read it individually, and we also have to read it as a school. I would highly recommend a reading project, as a matter of fact, among teachers and school leaders and folks in the district office and so on, um, where there's a common set of readings about race and diversity and so on, and we all read these things and we talk about them. So important, professional literacy. To move us uh, ahead, also, we need to have all school conversations about race and racial realities. And I don't mean just teachers talking with teachers. I also mean teachers engaging with parents and families in important conversations about race, creating opportunities for students to engage in conversations about race. So important. I'm going to give an example of what you might do for the students one um, in a moment. So hang tight there. Um, taking educational advantage of teachable moments beyond school context is so important. I hear in K-12 schools and higher education institutions alike as I travel the country that we didn't really talk about Ferguson because we were afraid that parents were going to get upset. When we forfeit opportunities to take something that is so current, for which there is in fact a national discussion happening, and we don't find ways to engage our own children and young adults, young people, in conversations about it, we have denied them a teachable moment, a teachable opportunity. So therefore, it doesn't surprise me that one can graduate from a high school such as this and then go off to college at Arizona State or Oklahoma or wherever and do the kinds of very horrifying things that we see in the news. What about that, right? The University of Oklahoma fraternity singing on the bus thing that got at least a week's worth of coverage in the national news outlet, wouldn't it have been great to have a conversation with seniors in this high school who will be going off to college next fall about, you don't want to be on a bus singing these kinds of things? Here's why, right? If we don't do that, there's a chance that a Grand Haven student will make national news a year from now. We have to do a better job of using current media. We do that through obviously diversifying the curricula by bringing in more readings, more examples of narratives and contributions beyond Martin Luther King. I love Martin Luther King, I do. So this is certainly not shade to Martin Luther King or like dissing Martin Luther King like, or minimizing his contributions. But that can't be the only person of color to whom we expose young white children in the curriculum. It just can't be. There's so many others, too many for me to name as a matter of fact. We have to be very intentional about supplementing textbooks with examples of people of color who've made extraordinary contributions to literature, to politics, to government, and so on. 
Uh, we have to also diversify our instructional materials. YouTube videos could, in fact, be one of the most powerful pedagogical resources that are often just so terribly underutilized in schools. I would argue that in a school district that lacks racial diversity, that YouTube videos actually afford you a no-cost opportunity to import diversity into your curriculum and into your classroom discussions, into lessons that are being taught. Right? Right. There has to be the uh, systematic assessment of biases and then obviously um, some very serious strategic effort to reduce biases. Uh, Rachel um, talked about the one assessment that they have at Harvard um, where you could go online and you take it and it tells you how racist you are. We have to be willing to take that exam. It's almost like a health screening. That if you have some scary suspicion, even if it's just a little bit of suspicion, that something might be wrong with you. Physically. We know that the answer is not to ignore it. Because if you do, it could be cancer. The tumor could be growing. The cancer could be spreading throughout your body. It can kill you. If you don't go, get it properly assessed and then work with your physician to identify a rigorous treatment plan. That same thing is at play here. If we don't assess our biases in a formal, systematic way, in health, it requires blood work or a urine sample or you know, some other kind of thing, right? Here, you don't have to, you don't have to draw blood or you know, pee in a cup. All you gotta do is just go online and take the thing and it will tell you and then engage in a conversation about what to do to mediate, to reduce these biases. I would even argue that having students take these bias assessments are so important because as the CNN study showed us, and by the way, Margaret Beale Spencer, the psychologist in the, in the thing, she's my friend, and she's one of the most famous educational psychologists in the world. She's a renowned psychologist at uh, University of Chicago. I could tell you that the work is for sure rigorous. So we know from Margaret Bill Spencer's work that was highlighted in that video that kids have these biases at very early ages, four and five-year-olds, right? So assessing those things before we send students away from Grand Haven just seems like such a good idea to me. Here's my last one. It's engaging in self-remediation. Oftentimes, when there is a conversation in education about remediation, it is concerning students. And remediating students' um, sort of underdeveloped aptitude for academic success at the next level. Right? Here, I would argue that teachers, professional educators, school administrators, teacher educators like myself are also in need of remediation. So little is taught in schools of education and in other places where teachers are prepared alternative certification programs and so on, about race and teaching responsibly about race and engaging in race questions. So little is taught, in fact, about hiring a racially diverse workforce in schools 
in retaining the few people of color that you get when you get them to ensure that it's not a revolving door, that they're not leaving. So little of that is taught. I have been a professor now at three schools of education. Look, I'm just going to tell you that so little is taught in those schools of education and in others around the country about what do you do when something pops off racially in your school and you're the principal? Where'd you learn that? If you didn't learn that. How to engage parents of color in a predominantly white school? Yeah, they don't teach that usually in schools of education and in other places where teachers are prepared. So we're taking this on right now, actually, in the center uh, with uh, what we're calling the Penn Equity Institutes. Um, it's this new sort of portfolio of uh, professional education experiences that we've created for uh, teachers and school leaders in both K-12 and in higher ed contexts. Um, so the idea is that we are bringing together educators um, 20 at a time with an instructor for a series of modules over six weeks, and they all happen virtually. Um, you know, it's not sort of like a creepy, like sort of chat room kind of thing, but instead, you know, think Google Hangout meets professional education. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, through engaging uh, school leaders and teachers and so on through the institutes, uh, that we can begin to remediate some of the things that people didn't get at earlier junctures in their careers. So we're starting this summer with the first uh, wave of institutes, uh, two in higher ed, and then there's going to be a series in K-12 uh, for principals of K-12 schools. Uh, so far, we've gotten applications from folks, and we're planning to sort of organize them by rural school superintendents, urban school superintendents, aspiring, or principals rather, uh, aspiring principals, uh, experienced principals, and so on. And we're really hoping that this will be a space that allows the center to teach people what they didn't learn in principal school about what do you do when you're the principal and, and you know, there are these problems and, and, and opportunities. Um, I want to leave you with two resources. Uh, there are two brand new books that both came out in November uh, 2014. Uh, the first one is Raising Race Questions, Whiteness and Inquiry in Education, and it's written uh, by a K-12 scholar, uh, Allie Michael. Allie is director of K-12 Partnerships and Professional Development in the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education at Penn. She's my, my friend and colleague. Um, this book gives so much guidance about how to productively engage in a conversation about race. Likewise, uh, my friend Estella Ben-Simone and her colleague, um, they both are at University of Southern California, wrote this book, Engaging the Race Question, and it's uh, situated in higher education. These are just two of dozens of texts that I could recommend to you. Um, I'm just going to conclude by saying that white children deserve to be properly schooled on race. Thank you. What an incredible and inspiring message by, by Sean. Thank you so much. Let's give him another big round of applause.